My name is Neil Shubin. I'm a professor on the faculty at the University of Chicago. I'm a paleontologist. I'm interested in the history of life. So my interest in evolutionary biology, genetics, paleontology, and all that stuff really began with curiosity. I was a kid who had uh, a different passion each week, whether it's astronomy or geology or natural history. So I entered college to, to study animals. And yeah, I was, I was like in my early 20s, and I got invited on this expedition to the American West. And I remember finding fossils for the first time. It was mind blowing to me. You know, here, digging in the rocks, we can uncover evidence for the history of life. I just thought that was so incredibly powerful. And so I was studying to be a paleontologist in graduate school and a number of scientific papers were coming out from a whole other discipline, from molecular biology, from studies of DNA, and not just any DNA, the DNA that builds bodies. And people were making incredible discoveries about how bodies were built from egg to the adult and how DNA was involved in that process. And I remember looking at those papers and thinking, wow. That is, that's just such a powerful approach to evolution. And so ever since, I've been combining these different disciplines, going out and finding fossils, working in the laboratory to understand the workings of DNA, to understand one particular area of science, which that is uncovering the history of life. Obviously, we're at a technological moment, an explosion of technology at the level of the genome, at the level of imaging, at the level of understanding the workings of the, of the earth, and the level of understanding and manipulating DNA. Those are all powerful. But what they are at the service of is understanding diversity. Really, what it, what's turning me on, what's, what really excites me every day, is that we are now of the capability to understand the diversity of life. Not just a small number of model systems, whether it's mice or yeast, but exotic species of biologies that we, we can barely imagine. You know? And so it's really exciting to understand the diversity of life with these different tools, because now all these different species become available to us as scientists to study. It wasn't the same way before. But the other thing about diversity, and this has been the story of science uh, since I've joined it, is it's become much more diverse itself, more diverse and inclusive. We're now much more diverse sort of set of scientists, um, different viewpoints, very international. And you know, as a lot of people will say, you know, better decision making happens. Um, more knowledge is gained by having diverse teams, collaborative teams of different kinds of people with different approaches and perspectives and backgrounds. We're at that moment of science as well. We have a long way to go, but it's much better than when I started. So underline diversity, diversity for experiments, diversity of scientists and, and themselves. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, with you in, in Kansas City uh, at Stowers Institute. This is, and if you don't know, this is just a treasure. Uh, this institution is a source of discovery and exploration in biology, and it's a true privilege to be invited here uh, to speak to the community uh, today. We're going to be talking about your inner fish this evening, and I, you're probably scratching your head saying, what is this a whole inner fish thing about anyway? But it probably behooves me to begin with how this whole idea of your inner fish began for me. And like anything in our world, it had many beginnings. I'm gonna give you two of those beginnings. Um, one of those beginnings was when I moved to the University of Chicago in 2000. I came to the university as the chairman of the anatomy department in the medical school. And my main responsibility was, at the time, to teach human anatomy to first year medical students. It's an incredible experience, um, this first year medical course. All of our medical students, that's 100 of them, have to take it. Uh, they're learning tens of thousands of new names of the human body, learning the structures and the organs and the tissues uh, of the body itself. And they're doing it while dissecting human cadavers. So you can imagine the room with 25, 30 cadavers, 100 medical students. It's a whirl of activity. And in fact, for our students, it's often very stressful. You know, they're confronting their new career, they're working very hard to memorize new names, and they're doing so confronting their own mortality often uh, over, uh, over cadavers. So to kind of chill the scene a little bit, I'd hang out over the tables and do the dissections with the students, and I'd you know, get to know them and they would get to know me. Almost invariably, they would ask, Dr. Shubin, what kind of doctor are you? Are you a, a cardiologist? Are you a neurosurgeon? Are you a psychiatrist? Whatever. I'd say, no, I'm a fish paleontologist. <laughs> what? 
No, well, I want my money back. <laughs> but, but it soon became clear that being a paleontologist, and not just any paleontologist, a fish paleontologist, is a powerful way to teach and learn human anatomy. Why? Because often some of the best roadmaps to our own bodies lie in other creatures. The best roadmaps to the complex tangle of nerves in our head, the so-called cranial nerves, that's in sharks and fish. It's simpler and I can teach it that way. The best roadmaps to basic structures in our own brain, including its overall organization, are in creatures like reptiles and so forth. And the reason for this is that in every organ, in every tissue, in every cell, in every gene of our bodies, we have artifacts of almost four billion years of the history of life. That's inside of us. What a wonderful story. And the way we know this is by going around the world and collecting fossils, some of which I'll show you today, by studying embryos of living creatures and comparing them, and studying the DNA that drives all that the development that we're going to talk about. It's a wonderful story, and that's what I'm going to try to unpack for you today. There's another origin for urinary fish, and that began when I was a student. I was a um, first-year graduate student, and I was terrified of the whole student thing. I didn't think I could do this whole research thing. And the biggest problem for me was finding a topic to work on. So I was in the first year of graduate school, and I was with a professor, and the professor led a class on the greatest hits in the evolution of life. And every week was like another huge event in the history of life. It was like, it was like speed dating with some of the great ideas and the great events in, in billions of years of history. And I remember that professor showing this exact slide in that course. And I remember looking at that slide and saying, that is what I want to do with my career. And I've literally spent the last three decades working on this slide. It's the story, it's a sad life, I'll tell you that one. But anyway, so, <laughs> so if you look at this, it captures in cartoon form sort of the essential question, the essential problem. What you see is a cartoon on top of a fish. That right there is a cartoon of a fossil fish, a creature known as Eustonopteron. It's first found in rocks about 390 million years old. And you look at that and you say, look, that's a good old American fish. That's a fish, right? It doesn't look like it. But on the bottom is a cartoon of an early limbed animal. That's a cartoon of a fossil that was discovered in East Greenland in the 1920s and 1930s. And it's one of the early, earliest creatures to walk on land. And this diagram captures how do you go from a fish that lives in water to a creature that walks on land? You just look at this. And if you look at the endpoints, it seems so utterly impossible, right? Fish live in water. They, they breathe, they excrete, they reproduce, they move about in water. Land living creatures, as the name implies, do all that stuff on land, totally different ways of making a living, different kinds of anatomy. I saw this and I said, that is a first class scientific problem, that's what I want to study. And I was training at the time to be a paleontologist, right? And so what do paleontologists do if they are good at their jobs? They find fossils. And so I set off, I want to find fossils. And I want to find fossils that tell us about this. And so I, what I wanted to do was find, say, something that, you know, it's a cross, an intermediate between these two. Maybe a creature that has a flat head like this, with fins, with arm bones inside, and stuff like that. I wanted to find an intermediate. So that's what I set off to do, and this is in the mid-1980s. And uh, I did what paleontologists had done a century before me. I followed the rule book, the playbook of paleontology. And I'll give you the playbook, I'll give you in conceptual form, kind of what drives the research program. It's going to sound very simple, and it is in principle. In execution, it's very hard. But in principle, if you want to find an intermediate between fish and land living animal, or an intermediate between reptile and mammal, bird and dinosaur, I don't care what the transition, these are the rules you follow. Okay, it's pretty simple. The first thing you do is you look for places in the world that have rocks of the right age to answer the question that interests you. Remember I told you the fish on top is about 390 million years old? The land living animal on the bottom is about 365. So you want something in that window of time between 390 and 365. That's the late Devonian. And the interesting thing is geologists from around the world, usually for economic reasons, have mapped the rocks in their borders. So you can obtain maps that show where rocks are of a particular age in a particular country. So you can get those, that information. The next thing is, it's not just rocks of the right age, it's rocks of the right type to hold fossils. Not every kind of rock holds fossils, right? I mean, in Hawaii, uh, that's volcanic rock, right? Volcanic rock lava is not going to hold fossils. It'll destroy what's ever in there, or nothing will fossilize. Metamorphic rocks, rocks that are hot, twisted and, and highly pressurized, that's not going to, anything in there will be destroyed. So what you look for are the kinds of rocks that will hold fossils 
and from the kinds of environments that creatures likely lived in millions of years ago. So in this case, I was looking for sandstones, siltstones, shales, from rivers and streams that would hold these things. So rocks of the right age, rocks of the right type, but it does me no good if my wonderful rocks of the right age and the right type are buried five miles underground. They have to be exposed to the surface, right? So we need exposed rock. When you open the pages of National Geographic or see a documentary with, with paleontologists, where are they working? Typically, they're working in deserts. And the reason why we like deserts is it's all exposed bedrock, right? You can work on the rock and you can see the bones that are weathering out. There you have it, honestly. Though in conceptual form, that's the toolkit we use to design new expeditions. We look for places in the world that have rocks of the right age, to answer whatever question interests us, rocks of the right type, to hold those fossils, and that's some nuanced geology there, but you get good at it. And finally, rocks that are accessible, that are exposed. That's, so now you can run out and be my competitor, and it's, it's all good. <laughs> There's a fourth variable I didn't know about at the time, but I was a young scientist. I was very naive. And in the fourth variable in my case that started everything was money, or lack of it. <laughs> so I, was, I, um, I uh, started, so I had, saw that slide right in the mid-'80s, and I got my first academic job in the late-'80s. And I'm all like, I, really, I want to find my intermediate. I want to find my flat-headed fish with fins. And my first academic job was in Philadelphia, right here in the southeastern corner of the state of Pennsylvania. I was at the University of Pennsylvania for 10 years. And I remember thinking, I want a research program I can do on turnpike tolls and gas money and do it totally on the cheap. Right? I didn't have the ability to lead exotic expeditions around the world. I couldn't raise money. I wanted to get in my Subaru and drive and work and find, find fossils. So I dug a geological map of the state of Pennsylvania out, and I've stripped it of everything unimportant. <laughs> and what you see here is the state of Pennsylvania. And look at this in purple. What do you see in purple all throughout mapped by the Pennsylvania State Geological Survey? Devonian age rocks. Remember I told you rocks of the right age? Devonian is a window of time, that, that's it, right? 390, 365. So I had, within about a three hour drive of my home in Philadelphia, I had rocks that were in the right shooting match in terms of age. The next thing is, were they rocks of the right type? And to give you a sense of that, they were perfect. Um, these, if you want to get a sense of what Pennsylvania looked like 365 million years ago, get Pittsburgh out of your brain, get Harrisburg out of your brain, get Philadelphia out of your brain, and think Amazon Delta. This is a cartoon of what Pennsylvania looked like 365 million years ago. It was done by the Pennsylvania State Geological Survey. We know this from the rocks. There's a package of rocks that have a signature of this. It was an ancient delta. The idea was, in the eastern part of uh, Pennsylvania, we're kind of where Scranton and Wilkes-Barre are today, you had a series of highlands, mountains. In the western part of Pennsylvania, actually extending into Ohio, you had an ancient seaway called the Catskill Sea. So if you look in that area, You'll see Devonian rocks, and they're marine. They're formed in ancient oceans. And draining from east to west across the state of Pennsylvania were rivers and streams going, <laughs> draining from the mountain, the highlands, all the way into the sea. And you could see that in the rocks of Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania Geological Survey mapped this. Now, if you're a paleontologist interested in finding fossils at the cusp of the transition from life in water to life on land, this is absolutely perfect. Why? Because if you have the exposures, you can sample fossils from the ancient seas, from the ancient estuaries, all the way upstream. You have all the relative environments, relevant environments, that the creatures that first walked on land likely lived in. Right? They're not living at the bottom of the ocean. They're living you know, somewhere along these. Perfect, right? My problem was I had rocks more or less of the right age, and rocks probably of the right type. But Pennsylvania is not known for its rock exposures. It's not a desert, right? It's good for the residents, lousy for the paleontologists who work there. So it turns out that my entire research program on the paleontological side in the early 90s came from thinking about finding new exposures. And in Pennsylvania, new exposures are made by Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. When the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation made a new road in the late 80s and early 90s, what would they do? They would widen a road, they would make a road, they'd blow up rock, right? And if I got really, really, really lucky, PennDOT would be blowing up rock in Devonian areas where that is mapped Devonian. So we got really good and really tight with the Pennsylvania Department of Transform uh, Transportation. I signed my life away to work on these sites. Um, and it's, you know, they'd blow up the rock, and my colleague Ted, who you'll hear about throughout the story here, Ted and I uh, would drive out to, um, to these sites, and we would look for fossils. And this is one of them. This is called Red Hill, Pennsylvania, because it's a hill, 
and it's red. <laughs> it's, you know, we're not clever with their names. We didn't actually name it. But the, um, the PennDOT in the late 80s and early 90s widened the road. And when they widened the road, they created this huge road cut. Look at this. We're on State Route 120, about an hour and a half north of State College, Pennsylvania. So this is an active roadway. You can see our cars all the way on the right-hand side. There's a human being for scale. Now, this is a wonderful road cut because this is a road cut that the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation just really gashed through Devonian rocks. So you're seeing all this red rock. And look at these layers. See all these different layers here? Right across. These are the layers. These are layer after layer of Devonian age rivers. What you're seeing in cross-section is an ancient delta. These are ancient rivers and streams that you could see cobbles and fine-grained sediments. This is just a whole delta system captured in time, you know, in the Devonian time. And what's amazing about this place, I actually pretty much where this gentleman is working, is as soon as we got to this spot, we started to find fossils. The first fossils we, we found were teeth the size of railroad spikes, or, your, or a, a large thumb. Think about that for a second, huge. And then, all of a sudden, we started to find, this is Ted um, holding the front end of a jaw of one of these creatures, jaws as long as your arm. You know, so we're pulling up these big, monstrous fish with teeth the size of railroad spikes, jaws the length of your arm, the whole body about 15 feet long, giant Devonian monsters coming out from this roadside in Pennsylvania. Now think about that for a second. Think about the juxtaposition of presence and past. Present day, roadside Pennsylvania, right outside you know, State College, Pennsylvania. In the rocks, an ancient Amazon delta with giant, monstrous fish. You know, so trucks are whizzing by, honking at us, and we're pulling out these giant monsters going, yeah, check it out. Anyway, so we started to find, um, we started to find all these other lobefin fish, like with bodies and heads and squash. You, I know this looks like a Devonian roadkill to you, but this is beautiful to me. It's a, it's a body of a, of a gorgeous fish. Um, and then we started to find limbed animals and bits and pieces of limb bones. We found shoulders. We found leg bones. We found this is an upper arm bone, a humerus. Uh, of an early walking animal, and it's identical in some ways. Remember that cartoon I showed you of the limbed animal from Greenland? It's identical uh, to that. We were discovering plants and invertebrates and fish and, and limbed vertebrates, so we worked with National Geographic to reconstruct what these ancient ecosystems in Pennsylvania looked like 365 million years ago, and this is it. Isn't that amazing? You know, he had some of the earliest forests. You could see the trees right here. We see them as fossils. You have some early shrubs. Look at those. They're really kind of shrubby things, but they're important because they stabilize these banks. And then in the water, in the fresh water, we have that, those giant monstrous fish. Remember the one with the teeth with the size of railroad spikes, the jaws, the length of your arm? Then we had all kinds of little armored fish, dozens of those species, and then all kinds of different limbed animals. A really an amazing ecosystem. All in rocks about 365 million years old. Ted and I were really loving this. This is in the mid-90s. But we realized we had a big problem a really big problem. We were finding lots of limbed animals, right? But they were very advanced. We were finding a great ecosystem, but we were likely in rocks too young to find that intermediate, that cross between fish and tetrapod, in fact, limbed animal. In fact, if we looked at scientific papers, we were probably in rocks, we were in rocks about 365 million years old. We had to go back in time to rocks about 375 million years old. So the action was all great ecosystem, but we were finding tetrapods, limbed animals already. We had to push it back in time. To give you a sense of what we were looking for, let me go back to the, what started all this, right? And you can look at the fish on top and the animal on the bottom, and you can see lots of differences. Let me give you a few salient ones, because it gives you a sense of what we were looking for and why we had to move back in time. Look at the head of that fish. These fish are so-called lobe fin fish. They're cousins of limbed animals. They're fossils. But look at that head. It's conical, right? And the eyes are on either side. But if you look at the head of the limbed animal, look at that. It's a flat head with eyes on top. And the nostrils sit, paired nostrils sit on top as well. So the geometry, the proportions of the head is, is different. So you have a flat, wide head with eyes on the top, dorsally. Okay? The other thing is, if you look at this, look at that fish on top. That head is connected to the shoulder right here by a series of plates of bone. There is no neck in fish. When a fish wants to look around, it can't swivel its head independently of its body. It moves around in three-dimensional space, you know, in the water. Whereas if you look at a limbed animal, they have a neck where the head is separated from the body and can swivel independently. That's a really good thing, right, to have a head that moves independently of the body. We love that, right? That's what I'm using right now to talk to you with. And it's particularly important in creatures that are on legs. And the other big thing is fish have fins with fin webbing. 
oh, I'm sorry, where the, whereas the um, uh, limbed animals have limbs, as I usually tell, with fingers and toes and wrists and ankles. And look at that's a big transformation. And you think about it, this is all of a piece. Well, think about that neck. That neck is important on a creature that is supporting itself on all fours. Think about this. Think of doing a push-up without a neck. Okay, you could do a push-up, but you can't look around, right? So this origin of limbs, of animals that walk on the land with legs, is actually, we see, coincident in time with the origin of a neck. Okay, but look at that. I've gone through all these things, but Ted and I were already finding fingers and toes and wrists and ankles in the fossil record. We had to move back in time. We wanted to find, say, a flat-headed fish with fins with arm bones inside. To do that, we, we had to push it back like 10 million years to 375 million years ago. And that meant going into a time period of the Devonian called the Franian. I know that doesn't make sense to you now, but it's going to make a ton of sense in a second. So Ted and I sort of pulled out the paleontological playbook again, looking for rocks of the right age, rocks of the right type, rocks that are exposed, but this time not 365 million years old, now 375, older in time to find a flathead fish with fins. We had an idea to work in Brazil. We had an idea to work in Montana. Everything changed in my office one day in, late, in 1997. Ted and I had an argument. This is the true story. Talk about the way discovery can happen. Ted and I were having an argument about geology. And to settle the debate, I pulled out my college geology textbook. This is true story. Now, this book is in this, was the second edition. This is the one I took. It's now in the 17th edition. That gives you a sense of how old I am. Um, but this, you know, I settled the debate with the textbook. I forget what the debate was about. It was just a friendly banter, that kind of deal. But, we're, you know, we're just talking afterwards, you know, chewing the fat, and I'm just sort of turning the pages of the book. And I saw another diagram that was to change my life. This one launching 13 years of expeditions to the, near the North Pole. And I'm going to show you that diagram, and we're going to work through it. It's going to look a little complicated. We're going to work through it a little bit because it gives you a sense of exactly what we look for. This is the diagram. This launched 13 years of expeditions, got us to uh, really think about it in a new way. So this diagram says Upper Devonian sedimentary facies. Now, what that means is Upper Devonian, remember, that's the window of time we're interested in, so more or less the right time. Sedimentary rocks, remember, these are the rocks that are, can possibly hold fossils. What you see is a map of North, of North America. See, there's the United States, there's Canada. And you can see Central America down here at the bottom. Superimposed on that map is an interpretation of the environments that the Devonian Age rocks were formed in. And I'll give you a sense of that. So in the western part of North America, these, guys, these folks mapped that there were marine, oceanic rocks in the western part of North America. That's not what was interesting to us. What they identified were three areas that were formed in ancient delta systems. So the first is in the eastern part of North America. I looked at that diagram and I said, oh, I know that one. That's the Catskill Rocks. That's what Ted and I have been working on for the last you know, five, six years. Been there, done that, right? That we knew about that. That confirmed that, they, that this is sort of on the right path with this, with this diagram. The next area shown in red was also formed in ancient delta systems. And that's been there, done that too. Remember that cartoon of the early limbed animal I've been showing you from, from Greenland? That's here. That was discovered here in the 20s and 30s by Danish and Swedish teams working, um, working um, working uh, really under primitive conditions. And then you can see where I'm going, extending 1,500 kilometers east to west across the Canadian Arctic was a series of mapped Devonian Age rocks from the, called the Fromm Formation, from the Franian Age. I looked at Ted. I said, Ted, do you know anybody who's worked these rocks? He says, I don't know. Do you know anybody? I said, Ted, I just asked you that question. So I boom, back and forth. Nobody worked these rocks. So I was like, wow, what an opportunity. So we ran to the library. This is in the mid-late 1990s, 1997. Now, libraries, as you may, know, may remember, have things with, called books that have paper. You know, so at the time, we looked at journals, and there was paper journals. We'd open the paper and look at the pictures. And we found an amazing, from using the bibliography of this undergraduate geology textbook, missed by us and all my colleagues, but these writers found it. Cited a paper by this gentleman, Ashton Embry. Ashton Embry is a, is a modern day explorer. Ashton had a, one of the world's great jobs. What he was hired by the Canadian government to do was to map the rocks in the Canadian Arctic, to produce those maps, to tell us what rocks are where in the Canadian Arctic. And so what Ashton would do is every summer, he would fly to the Canadian Arctic with an Inuit guide and a sledge and basic hand tools, a compass, a brunt and compass, a hand uh, axes, and so forth. Um, you know, a sledge, sledge dogs, canned food, and then they take off 
and leave him in the Inuit there for a month or, or more to map the rocks. Hopefully they'd leave him a can opener, and he would map the rocks. And what he did was um, produce an amazing scientific paper. And I'm going to show you the scientific paper. And there's method to my madness. I know you think I'm crazy, but this is the paper. This is the scientific paper that, in a nutshell, captures what we look for. It doesn't have a title that you know, you're going to go to the movie for, but it's like the middle upper Devonian clastic wedge of the Franklinian geosyncline by Embry and Clovan. It was published uh, in, the, in, the late, in the mid-70s, 76. And in this paper was one page that captures exactly what Ted and I were looking for, Ted Deschler. This page, people ask me all the time, how do you know where to look? And I point them to this page from Embry and Clovan, page 548, Embry and Clovan. When they talk about the age of the rocks, of the Devonian rocks in the Canadian Arctic, they say the available data indicate an age of early to middle Franian. Remember I told you we're looking for rocks in that age window, early to middle Franian, 375 million years ago? As soon as I saw that, I knew these rocks were at the perfect age. Then when they talk about what the kinds of rocks are, remember Ted and I were working in the Catskill Formation of Pennsylvania, finding tons of fossils. Uh, but you know, we're, we're wondering if this new formation in the Arctic, um, the Fromm Formation, had any fossils in it, and then this sealed it. Okay, this is what like, sent us to the moon. It says the Fromm Formation is similar to the Catskill Formation of Pennsylvania. Okay, so I had rocks that were like old friends, right, of the right age. Is there any like mystery why I then spent 13 years working in the Canadian Arctic? And then he showed pictures like this, which show us kind of how the, how the rocks are exposed. This all happened in a morning in 1997. And Ted and I were so excited, we, you know, we missed lunch. So we ran to a Chinese food restaurant down the street from the library at Penn, where I went in Philadelphia, where I was at the time. And I had whatever, you know, my hot and sour soup or what have you. But then I had a fortune cookie. Yeah, that fortune cookie I had, and it's moved with me from Philly to Chicago. I would carry it on my body if it wasn't glued to my door. It said, soon you'll be sitting on top of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Ted, you won't believe this. I got this I'm fortune cookie. We're out of here. I'm not like, you know, spooky. Although I, you know, I haven't lived a life of a ton of regrets. I actually, you know, I don't, not many regrets. One huge one is I've never played these numbers in any lottery ever. So. But anyway, so Ashton's paper, so I'm going to show you some of the diagrams. Actually, we're going to drill into it a little bit more in a little more detail to show you kind of what we're doing. So this is the kind of diagram we work with as paleontologists. This is from Ashton Embry's paper. So now we knew we were on the right track, right? Now it was a matter of like finding the islands and getting the money and getting the permits and getting a team together, all that nitty gritty. So we're, here we are up in, look on the upper left. This is a Nunavut territory in Canada. It's the northernmost uh, provin uh, province of, of Canada. And let's zoom in on it. You can see there's lots of little islands in there. So let's zoom in on those islands. That's what composes the bulk of this slide where my pointer is now, okay? One thing you should see is look at the scale, 100 kilometers. It's big country. Right? And everything circled in red are where Ashton mapped the Devonian rocks of the perfect age and the perfect type. This is an enormous amount of area to look at to find fossils. And the Fromm Formation right there is, this is this time column, the so-called stratigraphic column. It sits perfectly. This was perfect, right? Now the question became, how are we going to do this? I mean, I was used to driving my like, station wagon to central Pennsylvania. Now I'm leading expeditions here. Uh, five to 600 miles from the North Pole. You know, it's daylight 24 hours a day in the summer. It's dark winter, in nighttime 24 hours a day in the winter. We are, um, it's cold, right? Um, there are polar bears up there. Polar bears eat people. That was like on my mind all the time for 13 years. And plus, you know, we're really remote. We are about two to 300 miles from the nearest community. It's an Inuit village known as Grease Fjord, Canada, one of the northernmost settlements of the world. It's small, 150, 170 Inuit year-round living there. Um, this is a picture of the big city uh, in spring. All right, so that's kind of the nearest like, civilization to where we were. So, so much of what we have done working in the Arctic and later Antarctica is relying on aircraft. And it's a really remarkable thing that I spend so much time trying to think about how to get there. So where our sites are are beyond the tank of gas of a helicopter. Okay, so to get there, we use these planes, twin otters, which are amazing um, bush planes. They have a stall speed of 55 miles an hour, which means in a um, headwind, they can like vertical take off and, and, and landing. It's like spooky. You're like pulling your seat up as you're trying to take off, and they can land. Um, they can land right on the tundra, super slow. So what they can do is bring in the fuel and food, land on the tundra, and then the helicopters can leapfrog to our sites. 
Now, what this means is this affects our science. There's a reason why I'm telling this story. It's because since the terminal end here is the helicopter, helicopters have strict weight limits. So we can't bring a lot of people. Uh, we can't take a lot of fossils home because fossils are heavy. So a lot of decisions have to be made both in advance and, if, and while we're on site about what comes and what comes home. So I take a small crew. We don't take a lot of people. They tend to be very small. <laughs> we don't take a lot of stuff. So um, this is it. This is kind of like one of our years. This is, this is camp for a month and a half before it's set up. All our food goes in these tubs, these white tubs. They seal up almost airtight, because that's, that's good news, because the polar bears are out here and they have good noses. Um, we take you know, a lot of students, we take an Inuit, uh, usually an Inuit youth from the local village. It's uh, Brian Adagutak who worked with us. And then graduate students, postdocs, and so forth. But the idea is we optimize everything. We don't take a huge crew, because we, we just can't do it. So anyway, uh, let me work you through the logic of the Arctic. The Arctic the Arctic's huge, right? Think about the vast scale of this thing. How do you know where to look? How do you start? You know, and how do you narrow it down, this vast Arctic, to a small place to find fossils? Well, you make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> that's what you do. And you learn from your failures. And that's the story here. So we started in 1999, right here in the western part of the Arctic. And this is what camp looked like in 1999. This was my home for six weeks. We each live in a little mountaineering tent. These tents, when you build wind walls around them, can withstand winds of about 70 miles an hour. Really remarkable what they can withstand. This is our kitchen tent that first year. This is a remarkable tent, and it, it can withstand winds of about 30 miles an hour. So that first year I was in the Arctic, I, cha I chased this tent all around the, uh, the tundra <laughs> <laughs> during storms. It would literally blow. We had to like weight it down with all kinds of stuff. But you know, you camp at the base of these, we camp at the base of these uh, uh, snow fields. You can literally drink the water as it comes out of the snow field. So some people carry water bottles when they camp. I would carry a mug. It was a really amazing thing. Just put a mug there, and you're drinking this incredible water. Anyway, this gives you a sense of what we do. This is all what you're seeing here at the top of the slide. That's all Devonian rock. That's the rock that we work on. It's very low lying in this place. So it was a tough place to work. So what you do is you get out of the tent each morning and caffeinate, or, or don't caffeinate as your choice, and then look at these rocks. And basically, we would walk back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, over miles, looking to see where our bones are weathering out. So we're looking to see how the bones are weathering out of the rock. Because think about what happens here. You have a freeze-thaw. In, in winter, it's really, really cold. In summer, it's less really, really cold. <laughs> so it goes from really, really cold to less really, really cold. And what you have is this freeze-thaw. And what that does is it breaks up the rocks. You can see they're sort of broken up here. And it can spit the fossils out. So if you're lucky, you can actually find fossils weathering out on the surface here. And that's exactly what we did. But there was a problem. We were finding deep water organisms. We were finding deep water sharks. We were in the middle of an ancient ocean. Do you think I'd find limbed animals in the middle of an ancient ocean? Uh-uh, ain't gonna happen. So by the second week of this expedition, you know, not only was I chasing this tent around in, in storms, I was finding sharks, which is great. I love sharks, but that's not why I was there. I needed, we needed to move upstream to places where we can find fossils. So think about it. We were in the middle of an ancient sea. We needed to go upstream. And what that meant geologi geologically was the next year we had to go east. So we went east the next year, and this is what camp looked like. Look at that, new kitchen tent, yay. Um, but we also now got into a little more montane areas. These, aren't, these cliffs aren't as steep as they look. They're actually, you can, you can walk up them and down them. But what was great about this site was as soon as we got there, we realized we were in ancient rivers and streams. And as soon as we got to this, these rocks, since we're here, east, more easterly, they were the estuary, ancient estuaries, ancient streams and rivers, and we started to find bits and pieces of fish that we're looking for, bits and pieces of, of, of lobefin fish. Nothing I'd be here to talk to you about because it's bits and pieces. We needed a place where those where we can find whole skeletons. And that meant finding places where there are small rivers and streams. So how do we do that? Well, we found a new valley. So we went back in later years. And I'm going to show you, give you a sense of how everything changed for us. This is one of the most remarkable slides that I will show you today. And it looks completely boring. And at one level, it is. But at another level, it is mind-numbingly amazing because it caught a moment in time that we only, we're still scratch our heads about. So Ted took this picture. Ted had just finished lunch in this new valley we were working in. And we were beginning to find bones there, bigger bones, bits, not bits and pieces. We knew we were on the right trail. And uh, in this photo, Ted had just taken this. He loved this view. He just finished lunch. He stretched out, took this picture just because he liked the view. And in this picture, he caught something amazing just by accident. This set of blue pixels right there. I don't know if you can see. See that set of blue pixels right there? I wish I could blow it up. That is young Jason Downs. Okay, so young Jason Downs had just finished his lunch as well. 
And he stood up, if you look carefully, you can see he's standing, and he was about to walk off the slide, as was Ted to walk the other way. To give you a sense of things, our camp was about a mile to the right, okay, here. Jason walked off here all the way to the left. We didn't know that at the time. What happened was we spent the rest of the day after lunch working. I met Ted back at the main camp. We're back at the main camp, we're making dinner. And I look at Ted, and I said, Ted, have you seen Jason? He said, I didn't see Jason, have you seen Jason? I asked you that question. We went back and forth like, no, Jason, where's Jason? Now, Jason was a college student who joined us for, um, for the summer. And he, you know, he wanted to be a paleontologist, and here we lost Jason. All right, now, um, <laughs> Right, and you know, those of you who are educators know what happens. If you lose a student, it's like paperwork, like this. I mean, you know, be for years. Anyway, so we lost Jason. We're like, oh, well, we lost you. And so all of a sudden, I hear outside the tent footsteps, and zh, zh, the fly of the tent opens, the body of the tent opens. Jason's eyes are like globes. He goes, he's like, I found it. I absolutely found it. I said, what'd you find, Jason? A polar bear? What? And in his parka and his rain pants, he pulls out bone after bone a fossil fish. These are his hands. I got them. They weren't shaking enough, <laughs> too much. I got him to set his hand down. And these are all bits and pieces of lungfish and other lobe finned fish, which are kind of the fish we were looking for. So what happened was this. Jason walked off this slide, right, to the left. Then to go back at night, he got separated. Uh, and the reason why he got separated is he started to go back to Kent and walked over the slide this way, going from left to right. Because remember, I told you camp is all the way on the right. He walked over this patch right here. Now look at that patch. Do you see it's a slightly different color, right? You know why it's a different color? Because it's thousands upon thousands of fragments of fish bones weathering out of the rocks. That's what stopped Jason. He crawled that. So we're like, Jason, you did find it. Wow. And so we, um, you know, it's daylight 24 hours a day. We grabbed cliff bars, chocolate bars, bars and bars and bars. We ran to Jason's site. This is us at 2 in the morning crawling Jason's site on the upper right. Looking, not only picking up the bones, but looking for the layer that Jason's bones came from. Ah, it was remarkable. And it took us about a year to find that layer. It was not easy. Um, we're patient. Um, and this is Ted on the left with the jackhammer. We finally found Jason's lair. And it turns out, here's Jason's lair, right there, you can see. And it formed a layer about 20 to 30 feet long. And we'd form a line of us, and we basically dig into there. And you know what was happening? It was, it was layer upon layer a fossil fish skeleton piled one on top of the other. That's why there was that carpet of fragments, because those skeletons were weathering out. That's what stopped Jason. And now what we had was we had a whole layer that we could work one year after another looking to see skeletons as they came out. So we're pulling out skeletons about you know, two feet long, three feet long, four feet long. And this is kind of what the site looked like after we dug a very big hole. Uh, <laughs> digging that layer. And, and we worked this layer for a long time. We're pulling out lung fish. We're pulling out uh, armored fish. Fish on fish on fish. And everything changed one day, July 14th, 2004. I'll never forget the day. We're all working next to each other in line, pulling out skeletons. My colleague, Steve Gates, who's here in blue. Sorry, Steve, you're not in the slide. But he pulls out something from right here. Right there. And he says, you see something funny in there? He says, hey, guys, what's this? And as soon as I saw that, I knew we had found what we had spent years looking for. Countless dollars, countless sprained ankles, and so forth. What you see here is a V, right there like that. It's the same color as the rock. But you can see it's a V. And I looked at this V, and I saw that this V sits on top of a bunch of teeth right there. The little crack there had a bunch of teeth in it. That's one jaw. That's another jaw. It had the texture of fish, clearly fish. But this other side where the teeth were on top of that was a snout. And not just any snout, a snout of a flat-headed fish. I had the snout of a flat-headed fish staring at me in the Canadian Arctic. Now you're looking at this thinking, this guy is truly crazy. Where's the exit? <laughs> um, but I'm telling you that this was a flat-headed fish. Remember I told you conical head to flathead? We found a flat-headed fish staring right at us. I'm going to show this to you in a second. You're going to see it, and there's method to our madness. And so what Steve did is he roughed it out. You can see he roughed the pedestal out. And we, we wrapped it in plaster and brought it back to Chicago as, and Philadelphia. As we did that, we found four more of these flat-headed fish. Remarkable. We now have 20 of them. And they come back at the bottom of a the helicopter. There's the fish at the bottom of a helicopter and in, um, in a sling wrapped in plaster. There's a first-year graduate student for scale. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> Um, anyway, so this thing comes back over 100 miles, and now the real work begins because they come back to the laboratory. And they come back to the laboratory, and these fossils are you know, prepared. Somebody in 2004, 5, and 6 sat with a needle and a pin vise, removing rock grain by grain. 
And this is what Steve's specimen looked like after four months. Look at that. Look at that. It looks like we have a top of a head, doesn't it? There's one orbiter eye hole. There's another orbiter eye hole. Doesn't it look like a skull is coming out of this thing? Another five months go by. Boom, flat head. Look at that, one orbit. There's another. Wait a minute. There's a shoulder. There's another shoulder. It looks like this thing has a neck. Remember what motivated this? We wanted to find a flat-headed flat fish with fins with arm bones on side, inside. So what did we do? We looked for rocks the right age, rocks the right type, made a prediction, and this is the flat-headed fish with arm bones inside. It took us a number of years to find, and I brought, just for fun, which we can talk, I can bring it down to the reception later, this is a cast of the head of this particular specimen. It's about four feet long. Now, if I was to hold this in front of you, what you would see, just look at the slide and look at the, the specimen, um, it has scales on its back, fish. Fins with fin rays, fin webbing, fish. If you look at the shoulder, aspects of the shoulder and the bones in it are very fish-like. But, like a limbed animal, has a flat head with those eyes on top, has a neck that can swivel independently of the body, and guess what? When we cracked open those fins, what did we find? An upper arm, a forearm, even parts of a wrist, shoulder, elbow, wrist, in a fish, in fin webbing. And this creature had both lungs and gills. Amazing. Now, to give you a sense of how we found it, I told you there's method to our madness. Let's go back. Remember that V that you thought I was utterly nuts? This V is this. See, there's a crack, there's one part, there's another. This is what we first saw staring out at us, like that. So I saw the texture of a fish bone, I saw a flat head snout, I knew we found what we were looking for. So it was really sort of a remarkable moment for us. So now the creature, and now this is where the science really begins. Uh, so now like this, this critter, had, like a lobe fin fish, had fins, had scales, had primitive jaws. In fact, I can make a list of, fin, of fish features that go all the way to the floor. Like a land living animal, had a neck, wrists, flathead, and expanded ribs. Truly amazing. Now, when you discover a new species, you get to name it. That's one of the things that's really important here. And we were working you know, with the indigenous people, with the local Inuit population. And we felt it really important to include them in our, in our work. So we had a naming project with Inuit. And so we worked with the Inuit Council of Elders, and this is the, this is the committee as it was in 2005. Um, and uh, we had, working with them, we wanted to come up with a name for the fossil that really had two properties that were important. One was a name that was meaningful to them and to us, right? And so it had to be meaningful to everybody. And the other is to have a name that we could pronounce. Um, <laughs> the name of the committee did not lend me a lot of confidence that we could come up with a name that we could pronounce. <laughs> So I was talking to the gentleman in the middle. This is a really amazing moment. I, you know, I was in Chicago, and he was in Greece Fjord. You know, we were talking, you know, uh, he was in this small village in the middle of winter. And interestingly, it was very hard to come up with a name that meant something to both of us. They didn't have a concept for fossil, right? So I told him, you know, we found this fish. So where'd you find it? And we found it in the rocks. He said, hunters don't find fish in rocks. I know that, it's a fossil. And we went back and forth. Um, eventually, he got really frustrated with me. He said, okay, stop. Just tell me what it is and where you found it. I said, oh, it's a large freshwater fish. He said, why don't you say so? You got yourself a tiktaalik. I said, a tiktaalik, what's that? He says, a large freshwater fish in our language. And it, okay. So that, that stuck. So that was the, the name. So tiktaalik was the name that stuck. And so now, so that was 2004, 2005. Now we have high energy CT scanners where we can actually use x-rays, to high energy x-rays to blast through the rock. And we can see, we can look at the fins inside, and we can see it in great detail. We can look at the humerus, the upper arm bone, the radius and ulna. We can see the fin rays. We can reconstruct the, the vasculature. There's so much we can do in these, the technologies that have really come to the fore in the, last, uh, in the last decade and a half. But check this out. Here on the left are the joints in the fin. In A, what you see is the shoulder. There's the socket on a bone called the glenoid. There's the ball on the humerus. In B, you see the elbow of the fish. This is a fish with an elbow, with a radius and ulna. It could flex and bend and pronate. And then it has a proximal carpus and a distal carpus that are very similar to the ones that we see in amphibians. Really, really, I mean, the, at the cusp of the transition from life in water to life on land. So Tiktaalik is an animal that has lungs and gills, has fins with arm bones inside, has shoulders that are part fish, part limbed animal. It's a really beautiful window into this great moment in the history of life. But the central point for us is not just that Tiktaalik is a great window into the history of, into this, this great moment of time, but that this moment of time, 
where fish began to walk on land, is not some esoteric branch of the tree of life. It's inside each one of us. I could trace structures that first came about in Tiktaalik and its cousins to us. Look at this. We can trace an upper arm bone from Tiktaalik to amphibians, to reptiles, to other mammals, to people. We can trace the radius and ulna from fish to amphibian, to, tetra, to reptile, to mammal, to people. I could trace this wrist we see for the first time in Tiktaalik and its cousins living in the Devonian to us. I could trace the neck we see in Tiktaalik and its cousins in Devonian first time all the way to us. So what that means is every time you bend your wrist, every time you shake your head, you could thank Tiktaalik and other fish evolving in the Devonian 375 million years ago. And we know that craziness. We know that when we could trace it through the fossils. We know it, as I'll show you in a second, by looking at embryos and by the DNA that drives the development of those embryos. It's an amazing story that connects us to the rest of life on our planet. And once you see it, it changes how you look at the natural world, changes how you look at humans' place in nature, and it changes how you do your research. You look at this gentleman, and you see what? A pinnacle of human achievement. You, he, you see Albert Einstein. I look at this. I'm somebody who's worked on fish for 30 years. And I see, yes, I see a big, fat, old, bipedal fish. <laughs> and when you, you can compare Professor Einstein to the fish. Um, I labeled it here. Einstein's on the left, by the way. Um, <laughs> You can compare Professor Einstein to the fish in so many ways, by the fossils that connect us, but importantly, through how they develop. Let's look at this. Let's look at Einstein's head a few weeks after conception. What did, Einstein, what did our head, what did Einstein's head look like? And this is sort of a cartoon snapshot of it. What you see here is the top of the head. You could see paired primordia for the eyes. These are where the eyes are going to develop. But then, and I've color-coded several areas, where you see these swellings in the pharyngeal area, in the, in the sort of throat area, you see paired swellings, which I've color-coded, left and right. Here, light blue, dark blue, green, and yellow. Those swellings are filled with cells. And there are cells that are dividing in there, but there are also cells that are moving and migrating in there. It's an amazing thing that goes on in there. But these swellings have clefts between them on the outside. And inside, they have furrows. It's an amazing set of structures. Guess what? If you look at anything that has a head, and let's look at a shark, guess what you see? It doesn't look identical. The embryo looks a little bit different but they have some very similar features. They have paired primordia for the eyes, as a shark embryo, and look down lower in the pharyngeal area, you have these swellings, light blue, dark blue, green, uh, and, and yellow, paired clefts, and so forth. That's a starting point, a common ground for development for a lot of for creatures with heads. Now let's trace these things. You can trace the cells, you can mark the cells, and you can see where they end up. And if you look at this, if you look at a shark embryo, that first one, the light blue, becomes portions of the upper and lower jaw. The other ones become portions that support the gill apparatus. And this includes the skeleton, the, the nerves, the muscles, as well as the, um, the vasculature. So it's really muscles, nerves, arteries, and bones. What happens in people and other mammals? Well, check this out. That first one in light blue, you trace the cells. The one in light blue becomes bones that uh, form part of our jaw, as well as two bones in the middle ear. The dark blue ones become a portion of a throat bone known, the hyo known as the hyoid, as well as one bone in the middle ear. And then the other ones become uh, portions of the voice box. What does this mean? This means in a developmental sense, many of the muscles and nerves and bones I'm using to talk to you with right now, and many of the muscles and nerves and bones you're using to hear me with, correspond to gill structures in sharks and fish. And how do we know this? We know this by comparing the embryos. We know this by seeing their common point of development. We know this also by the fossil record. I could trace the history of this gill bone in a shark through fish and creatures like Tiktaalik to become the stapes of the middle ear. Once you know how to look, you start to see our connections to life uh, everywhere. And this is really remarkable because you know, when you think about some of the great puzzles of biology, what researchers here, in particular at Stowers, are thinking about, you know, we think about a fertilized egg. A fertilized egg is a single cell. Right? And, but all of us trace back to that single cell, right? And, but all of us sitting here are trillions of cells, all packed in the right place. You know, maybe four trillion cells of our own cells. There are microbes all around us, even more of them. But of our own cells, we have trillions of cells, eye cells, muscle cells, bone cells, gut cells, all kinds of different, and they all are in the right place. And things can go really wrong when they're in the wrong place. But that formation from a single cell 
to a creature with trillions of cells in a body, we call that bodybuilding, right? Going from the thing on the left to the thing on the right. But this diagram captures one of the great challenges and one of the great puzzles of biology. How does a single cell contain the information to build a body with this incredible organization which we take for granted? And that's been where some of the great breakthroughs in science have happened in the last 30 years. Understanding the DNA recipe, the DNA toolkit that builds bodies as different as people, flies, fish, worms, and so forth. It's a remarkable story. One area of this story is showing that many of the genes that build the basic architecture of our body are also present in other creatures. So if you look at, say, our vertebrae, our backbone, we have a regular pattern of different vertebrae, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral, that exist in our bodies. And our limbs always pop out of the same place in the body. We have a basic architecture of backbones and limbs that stick out in the right way. Turns out that whole process depends on certain genes being turned on and off in the right way at the right time in development and interacting with one another to make the body plan come about. One of the remarkable stories is that these genes were originally discovered in flies, in embryos of flies. And what were they doing in flies? Versions of the same genes are building the basic architecture of flies. It's a remarkable story. It's an incredible thing. And it's not just bodies. It's organs of all kinds of different, of different kinds in the body, that we share a basic toolkit with other creatures on the planet. So you can ask the question, who really cares about your inner fish? Well, I care a lot. But it um, turns out that places like the Stowers Medical Research Institute care a lot. The Nobel Prize Committee in Medicine and Physiology cares a lot. Because think about this. Where have basic breakthroughs that happened, that have led to research that has, has changed human health and well-being? Well, Nobel Prizes in the last 30 years have gone to people working on flies, working on people going on, working on mice, working on yeast. In fact, two Nobel Prizes awarded in the last 15 years have gone to five people working on Cenorhabditis elegans, a tiny little worm the size of a comma on a piece of paper. Yet that little worm is providing insights into how our cells are programmed to naturally die, how our genes can be turned on and off, and particularly off, and what goes wrong in diseases like cancer. I like to think that as we discover cures to everything that ails us, from Alzheimer's to different cancers, that the breakthroughs that will extend and enrich our lives will in some way be based on flies, worms, mice, species yet to be discovered, and yes, in some cases, even fish. I can't imagine a more powerful or more beautiful statement on the importance of our connection to the rest of life on our planet than that. Thank you very much. <laughs>